right. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just as he said, <clears throat> one of the things we've noticed <clears throat> is that when people, <clears throat> we don't require other people's faith to get them healed. We minister to them through our faith and we get them well. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we've noticed is that when people get healed on other people's faith, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> many times that's when they don't keep it. They, they get it, <clears throat> but then as soon as they leave, the enemy comes along and says, and because it, they know, the enemy knows that they got it on somebody else's faith, so then he comes back in and says, oh, that was just temporary, that was just this or that, and then he tries to attack again. Now, <clears throat> noticing this, one of the questions we have, this is a very good question, because <clears throat> years ago, there was a book called uh, The Intercessor <clears throat> by Reese Howell. And it, the idea is good. The problem is he was experiencing some things and he didn't rightly divide the word concerning it. <clears throat> now what he saw was um, when he would minister to people, <clears throat> he would get into intercession and as he was starting to make headway there, getting their problem off of them, he started experiencing the same symptoms that they were experiencing. He saw that as being spiritual and entering into their sufferings, right? Now, but we have to realize, we're not Jesus. He bore that for them. Our job is to get it off of them. If it's not right for them to bear it, it's not right for us to bear it, <clears throat> even in intercession. So what is actually happening here, see, the enemy loves it when he can fool people into thinking something and then torture them or cause them to suffer <clears throat> by what he has convinced them is truth. <clears throat> so what happens is this. Remember I told you there were three ways people get sick, usually... <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> wow, that went the wrong way. <clears throat> there we go. So it was through sowing and reaping, <clears throat> through accidents or attacks. Well, a subcategory of attacks is counterattack or what's generally known as retaliation. So when you, <clears throat> for instance, you walk up on two people fighting, and it's a big guy jumping on a little guy, and you go up and you get the big guy off the little guy, and then what do you, what do you think is going to happen? The big guy is going to come after you. That's what happens. So when you go after this thing, and you're helping the person that's getting beat up, then you get the attention of the enemy, and then he draws his attention to you, because you were the one that got him off of that person, right? So that's why you start experiencing some of the same uh, symptoms, because it's the same problem causing. That's see every everything every spirit <clears throat> causes the symptoms that it is. A spirit of fear is not something scary; it is something that is scared. And when that spirit comes on you, you get scared because you take on its characteristics. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you're praying for a person and their symptoms come onto you, it's because now you've got that thing's attention and it's probably alleviating off of them while it's on you. But if it's not right for them to bear it, it's not right for you to bear it, right? So you refuse it for, to begin with. Don't think it as a mark of spirituality, right, of how deep into the spirit you're getting. No, <clears throat> you're letting the devil beat up on you. Don't do it, Amen resist, and keep it off of you, okay? Now, <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> now, notice here, uh, we were on page 40, uh, what, 41, yeah. <clears throat> Talking about how Jesus, why Jesus healed, okay? <clears throat> and it was always because of compassion. Anytime it mentions why Jesus healed, if there is a mention of why, it always says compassion. That's the only reason ever given, all right? Now, if you look on the next page, page 42, this is one of those <clears throat> big sacred cows that come along. In Matthew 17, verse 14, it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, 
Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falls into the fire and into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. <clears throat> then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Notice he answered their question. There's the answer, right? Because of unbelief. Now, for verily I say unto you, <clears throat> for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say. If you have faith, you shall say. You hear that? If you have faith, you will say. If you don't say, you don't have faith. You hear that? Well, I'm not going to say it until I see it. Well, you won't see it till you say it. Right? <clears throat> because you have to say it because faith speaks. Now, then he says, <clears throat> uh, If you have faith as grain of mustard, say, mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Why? Because of faith. You got that? Now, notice... Verse 21 is not in the Greek text. It's not even in most translations anymore, right? This is one of the few good times that they actually took a verse out. Because <clears throat> this, Jesus could not have told them this. Now, the reason I say that is because <clears throat> they had come to him. Actually, it's right here in the same passage. We'll just go ahead and read it on Matthew 9. Notice Matthew 9. We just read out of Matthew 17, right? How many of you know Matthew 9? is before Matthew 17. All right? So Jesus had already said what I'm about to read before he said this, supposedly, right? Verse 14, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus saith unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So when were they supposed to fast? After he's gone, right? In Matthew 17, is Jesus gone? No. no, so they were not required to fast. So Jesus could not scold them. He couldn't get on to them, and he couldn't tell them the reason you can't do this is because you're not fasting when he already told them, you don't have to fast till I leave. Do you see that? <clears throat> now, again, <clears throat> you don't see this in the original Greek. Now, the closest you find it is in Mark. And in Mark chapter 9, it actually has this passage here. But you have to realize that we cannot build a doctrine off of a one-time statement. Do you get that? <clears throat> the statements have to be verified. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing has to be established. So everything else, all these things, it's amazing too because some people have a problem with Mark 16. And they'll say, well, Mark 16 wasn't in the original Greek. It wasn't in the past. Okay, <clears throat> people say that. But in reality, uh, what they say is, Mark 16 wasn't in the best manuscripts. Okay, that depends on your two things. It, number one, it depends on who's deciding what is the best manuscripts. So if you get a bunch of people together that don't believe in power, they're going to say the best manuscripts are the ones that don't have it. Do you get that? <clears throat> number two, you have to realize that the best manuscripts are not always the oldest ones necessarily, but the ones that are most complete. Now, if you look in Mark 16... There is nothing in Mark 16 that is not found <clears throat> in other places, both in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. There's nothing there, right? <clears throat> you can see everything that took place in Mark 16, 15 through 20, in other places in the Gospel. So <clears throat> it is still valid of what he said. Does that make sense? Now, there's other, what they would call textual criticism that you can look in and prove what scriptures were there and what, what, which ones were not there. Now, notice here, <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> and here's a, here's a big point. Whenever Jesus, uh, this man brought his son to Jesus' disciples, they apparently tried to cast this thing out, and they couldn't, right? Because he said, I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. So they tried, but couldn't do it. Now, at that point in the modern Christian church, people would have said, it must not be God's will. We prayed, it didn't happen. Must not be God's will. But then the boy was taken to Jesus, and Jesus cast it out, which proves it was God's will, just the disciples couldn't do it. 
So remember, the failure of a disciple does not dictate God's will. Do you get that, right? Because too often we have a theology of failure where we will say, uh, I prayed, it didn't happen, so it must not have been God's will. Well, what about the part of faith? Maybe you weren't in faith. Oh, I believe, I know I believe, I know I was believing, I know I was in faith. Well, okay, I'll take you at your word, and we'll say you're right, and you were in faith, so our only conclusion must be God lied. I don't think anybody's wanting to do that, right? right? So we have to decide. <clears throat> Either God lied, or you thought you were in faith, but you probably weren't, right? And so you have to realize, <clears throat> now, there are instances when you can be in faith with one person and not be in faith in the next. Why? Because your faith can fluctuate, and it can depend on a lot of things. It can, now, it shouldn't, but generally it does. Matter of fact, if you're going to pray, you will generally have much greater success, especially in the beginning, <clears throat> of praying for people you don't know than for praying for people you do know. Mainly because this reason, the reason for that is because you're too emotionally connected to them and you're not loving them with agape love, you're loving them with storge or with filio love, right? And that kind of love doesn't work. See, emotions don't heal. Soul doesn't heal. Spirit heals. Amen? <clears throat> so, because you're so close to them. Now, see, when I go, years ago, uh, <clears throat> my dad was having some situations going on. And when I was driving down, it was about a two-hour drive. I was driving to their house. And when I got there, on the way, actually, God said, how are you going there? And I said, I'm going there to pray for my dad. He said, uh, do you want to get results? And I said, well, yeah, of course I want results. He said, then don't go there as his son. Go there as my son. And I started realizing the difference. And so when I went there, I walked straight in pretty much right to my dad. <clears throat> I didn't stop and say hi to my mom and all that kind of stuff like I would normally do. And so I kind of walked right on in. I went right up to my dad. And I said, in the name of Jesus. I laid hands on him. I commanded this thing to go. I said, okay. And then whenever he finished, I said, all right, in Jesus' name, done. Now, get up and act like you're healed. And he got up and realized he was healed. Now, <clears throat> the funny thing was, my mom was looking at me and kind of like, okay, that's different. And now, here's, and I, I want to, this is such a strong principle. I explained to her that if I had come in as his son, as my dad's son, right, then I would have come in and I would have loved him and I wanted him healed because he's my dad. But that's not how I get anybody else healed anywhere else. Why? And the reason I get other people healed is because, and I don't even know them. But the reason I get them healed is because I truly believe by his stripes. And there is no emotional aspect to it other than the fact that God's word is true. This thing is an enemy. They're supposed to be free, and I'm here to set them free. And that's that. It is cut and dried. Amen? So, and, I, you know, I don't really have good bedside manner. Okay? <clears throat> I'm pretty blunt and that kind of stuff. Why? Because emotion. See, what most people think, well, what about love? That is love. Hey, let, me, let me show you. Love isn't what you say. Because he says, let us not love in word only, but in deed. So love isn't a word. It's a deed. It's an action. Hey, do you get that? And so you have to realize that Jesus said, no greater love has any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Now the thing is, <clears throat> go into, how can you go to somebody and lay down your life for them? By going to them and just speaking a word and, oh, you know, you you this. This is horrible. It's terrible. No, that's not love. That's not even compassion, right? That's just sympathy, right? Because at least compassion would do something to help. <clears throat> but we have to realize love is for the last 30 years that I've been laying down my life to be ready to minister to that person. Do you, do you get that? To, so we have to realize that love is an action. It's being obedient to the Word of God. It has nothing to do with emotions or feelings, nothing whatsoever to do with it. Right? Now, I'm not saying you can't be emotional. I'm just saying if it's your emotions that are driving you, <clears throat> you're probably not going to get people healed. So you're, what has to drive you has to be the fact that you've laid down your life, you believe the Word of God, and whenever I go in and minister to, to my dad, I had to treat him just like I would treat anybody else. The reason most people don't get loved ones healed is because they're too close to the situation, they're too emotionally connected, and they want them healed because they love them, but they love them with an earthly love not with God's love. With God's love, you have to love them the same way you would love your neighbor's kid 
and you want your neighbor's kid healed just like you want your kid healed. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so there has to be that. This is probably the one big thing that most people don't get, especially in modern times, because in modern times, everybody has an idea of what love is. <clears throat> but real love, what did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say. Don't call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say. Isn't that right? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So you show him your love by how you keep his commandments, not in a jot and tittle type of way of keeping them, but in the spirit of the commandments, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, which is what? First commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto the first, which is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love your neighbor as yourself? You do unto them as you would want done unto you. Just that simple. So when you do to others what you'd want done for you, you're walking in love. Walking in love is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not a, you know, <laughs> goosebumps. It's not, you know, well, well I, just, I just don't feel love. Well, it's not how you feel love. See, you, how you feel love is not determining whether I'm loving or not. See, I can, I can love and you not feel it. Why? Because you could be shut off to it. You could, have, you could have a wrong idea about what it is. And you could, mistaken, or you could mistake it for something else. Do you understand what I'm saying? I determine if I'm in love. You don't determine if I'm in love. I determine, right? And if I do something in love, I know if I've done it through love, right? You can't determine it because your feelings would be a bad way to judge my love walk. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, you know, I just don't feel love. No, my love for you is the fact that I've laid down my life to study this out and bring it to you, give it to you, not charge you for it, but get, give it to you and get you healed and spend the time that it takes to do so. That's love. Not just the words of, oh, love, grace, peace, and just say words, right? <clears throat> True love goes beyond words. But the church doesn't understand that yet. The church still thinks that love is just how people feel, and let's have a good service, and let's feel good, warm, fuzzy feelings. And, it, and honestly, all that, every bit of that is new age. It has nothing to do with the love of God, right? See, so the love of God suffers. The love, for, the love of God hurts. And what I mean by hurts is the, the person who is loving with the love of God will hurt for the other person. Not in a hurt in the sense, like we were talking about before, where they take on the symptoms. But I'm saying, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How do you think that made him feel? How do you think it made the son of God feel? Because he, he, he knew from the beginning, when he was in the garden even, he said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. If there's any other way. Let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's love. Doing things you don't want to do because it's the right thing to do. Do you get that? <clears throat> you can't just say, well, you know, be warm, be filled. No. You're supposed to, if you have to give, you give because that's what love does. If it's within the hands, you give it to them. Isn't that right? See, we have to get beyond this emotional, soulish love. That's why there's so much most churches are, are more soulish than spiritual. And they're, they, they are geared to getting a soulish response. That's why some music is played on purpose to get a certain response. And that is soulish, not spiritual. Why? Because the spirit doesn't change. Why? Because the spirit is of God. And God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the spirit, it doesn't change. Your spirit doesn't go up and down, back and forth. No, that's your emotions. Amen? And when you learn to get past that, and you start to realize that it doesn't matter what your emotions are doing, but you're moving forward and you're going to minister to this person, wow. it's amazing. Because here's what, let me, let me show you how the enemy tricks you. <clears throat> the, most, the time of most fights among Christians is on their way to church. Why? I mean, it's, it's in the car, fighting back and forth, and, and then you pull up out front and I'll say, okay, we're here, smile. You know, nobody has to know anything. Remember, as far as anybody knows, we're a perfect Christian family. So everybody put on your church face. Man, I mean, I don't want to see anything else. And if you don't have a church face on, when we get back house, I am going to wear you out. So you better go to church and enjoy it. Right? I mean, and then they fight all the way there. Right? Why? Why does the enemy do that? Why does the enemy want us to fight on the way? Because he knows that most churches are soulish. And if he can affect your soul and emotions on the way, when you get there, you won't enter in by the Spirit. You'll be so focused on your emotions, it'll take you 45 minutes to get from, I'm just mad and I don't even want to be here, to, oh, thank you, Jesus. 
right? And so the enemy tries to work on that, and he knows if he can get you in that soulish realm, he's got you beat, and you won't get anything done in the spirit. But once you learn that your soul has nothing to do with that, <clears throat> that literally your spirit is the same regardless of what's going on in your soul. You know, they say that you get to a certain point, <clears throat> like both in land and sea. You get down to a certain point, the temperature is the same. What is it, 58 feet down or something like that? The temperature stays, you know, what it's a cool temperature, and you can actually keep food down there, and it would keep it, right? At a certain, no matter where you are, you get down that many feet, and it's constant temperature. You go in water. Or water currents, or most water currents, or surface level are only so far deep. You get down so far, there's really not that many currents. So the big currents are all on the surface. So you get beyond that. It's the same thing with your emotion. Your emotions have all kinds of currents, all kinds of things, but you get down so far, it's a constant. And that constant is where your spirit is. That's why that constant is supposed to be peace. See, that's where your spirit is. Your soul may be in turmoil, but your spirit can be in peace at the same time. Amen? That's why you can have these things going on all around you, and yet you can see it, but it won't affect you because you have that peace inside that you just keep on walking. So you could actually, and I'll, I'm just going to be transparent, tell you the truth, right? Because you're going to walk in some of this, so you ought to know. How did I figure this out? I had fights with my wife. <laughs> okay? Well, the devil would know it. We'd get in this big argument. He'd start an argument over in the middle of nothing, you can't even remember what you're arguing over, but bless God, you don't want to lose. So, so you just don't stop, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then you always make sure, especially us men, we got to have the last word. If you're smart, it's yes, dear, but that's a whole other thing. No, so, but you have all this stuff going on. And so I, we, me and my wife would argue, and then I would get in my car, and I'm heading to the office or heading wherever, sometimes even to church or wherever, and my phone would ring. And it would be somebody dying. Why? Because the enemy knew somebody's fixing to call me. He probably heard them say, I'm fixing to call Curry because I just, I, I'm, you know, my loved one's about to die. I got to get a hold of Curry. And he's going to break. And the devil goes, Well, I got to get Curry in a state where he is ineffective. So this person will die. See, that's the purpose. He's trying to get that from you to where you're ineffective for the kingdom. And so I answer the phone. When I answer the phone, I'm like, Hello. Why? Because I'm still mad. Right? And I'm trying to be nice, but I'm still mad. And this person's dying, right? And they're, here's what the doctors say, and they're on their last breath, and it could be any moment. And I'm like, you know what? Bless God, let me tell you something. You be healed now. I'm not playing. I'm not joking. I'm telling you right now, bot devil, you better get, because I am fed up with you today. Now, you're getting, getting out of this person. I mean now. I don't mean maybe. And this is how it's going to be. Do you understand me? And this person on the other phone, they think I'm talking to them. And they're like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yeah, uh huh. You know? I'm like, all right, well, you just be healed in Jesus' name. Hang up the phone. And they got healed instantly. And then I get the call back 30 minutes later. Everything's gone. It's amazing. They're up moving. And I'm like, how did you do that? I was upset. I was mad. I was, I was praying mad. And he said, yeah, and you were totally involved and you were hitting that thing full force and your soul had nothing to do with what was going on out there, but you allowed now your spirit to latch on to that force and that aggression and you blasted that thing out. And so I had to learn how to be able to blast these things, but I also had to do it not from getting mad at somebody else. <laughs> and so I had to turn that aggression toward the devil and get aggressive toward him. But I realize the soul can influence you, and you can, you can use it, but in reality, it has nothing to do with it. So, I mean, imagine if, if the devil was just ragging on you, just, you're no good, you're nothing, you can't do nothing, you'll never do nothing. And then somebody calls and says, please help me, I'm dying. What are you going to think? What are you going to say to him? Oh, Father, if you will, if it's your will, Lord, bless them, help them, Lord, do something. What, 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 I mean, think about that. It's like people saying, when you tell people to cast that devil out, to cast means with violence, right? He doesn't say counsel the devil out. He says cast the devil out, amen? I mean, think about it. If you have, and it's, it's so funny. People get mad. When you interrupt people praying, they get mad, even if they're praying wrong. They'll get mad. And I've had people, I said, all right, now you pray for this person. 
Oh, fuck. I, mean, I, just, I just showed them. I said, do this. Say this. Hit this thing. In the name of Jesus. Cancer, leave this person now. Go in Jesus' name. Body, be healed. Now you do it. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just pray. I'm like, were you not listening? I just told you exactly what to say. Stop praying. Stop praying. And they're like, and then they get mad at you. Well, I was praying. No, you weren't. That's not prayer. Pray like I showed you. And it's amazing because then you have to actually turn them around and get them to. The, now, think about this. Imagine trying to cast out a devil like that. Oh, devil. <laughs> devil, would you please leave? Think about that. I mean, if you talk, what do you, what do you think a devil is going to say when you, he's going to go, uh, no, how's that? <laughs> okay, must not be God's will. No, no, it's God's will, it just wasn't the devil's will. And you let the devil's will override God's will. So you have to be able to speak to this thing and command it to come out. And you have to convince it that you know what you're talking about. You have to convince it that it must listen to you. Right? I mean, if you went to, I mean, imagine a policeman. Excuse me. I um, hate to bother you, but I need to arrest you. I'm, I'm sorry. Really, you know, I hate doing this. But, you know, would, would you come along? Think about that. If he, if he approached somebody like that, they're going to go, no. No, I don't think I'm going to do this. And why? Because he's shown no authority. See, this is, what, this is the one thing you got to get. Not, not the one thing that I told you in the beginning. This is another one thing, okay? <laughs> this, okay? But you got to get this, okay? It's real simple. We are God's policemen. So your job is to understand that authority. The greatest Faith, Jesus ever saw, was a man who understood authority. If you're going to operate in faith, especially great faith, you're going to operate in authority. See, that's what stood out about Smith Wigglesworth. And he passed that on to Lester Sumrall. And Lester Sumrall walked in that authority. And I saw that in him. And then I went and studied under him and and spent time with him and asked him questions and spent some time. And I got that. And I didn't even know it. For years after that. And then somebody would say something, and I would answer them. I'm like, oh, that was Dr. Sumrall. I, I, rec- I didn't even know I knew that. It would just come out of me. It was Dr. Sumrall. And so then I started recognizing things and started realizing that <clears throat> there was a difference in how I walked and how I talked. And it wasn't an act, even though you can act yourself into believing. In other words, why do you uh, think about this? You take a bunch of young men, and, and women too, but you take, a, let's just say, a bunch of young men. You take them down to a military uh, you know, base somewhere, straight out of school. They don't know anything about the military. You pile them all in a bus or put them on a plane, take them somewhere, get them off. You start yelling at them, tell them to line up. They don't even know how to line up. You know, how hard is it to line up? Well, apparently it's pretty hard because they can't figure it out. You know, they're all standing sideways and standing and doing all this stuff and, you know, and, and they're trying to get you to stand up and they tell you stand up straight, put your feet together, shoulders back, head up, and, you know, keep your mouth shut and <laughs> this kind of thing. And they got you all lined up. And then and inside of a couple of days, they got you marching in rank, right, in step with one another. And now what are they doing? You're not a soldier, but even though you raised your hand. Isn't that right? You raised your hand. You swore an oath or, be, or became part of a military. You're a soldier in name only. You don't know how to march. You don't know how to do anything. But then they take you and they cause you to act like a soldier until you become one. They teach you to march until you actually march. And at first, you know, you're trying to get in step and, you know, get your, you <laughs> try to get in step with everybody else. And so they train you <clears throat> by physically causing you to do certain things. You can act yourself into believing faster than you can believe yourself into acting. That's what John Lake said. Why? Because you start to act like who you want to be. And I saw that in Dr. Sumrall, and I imitated him. I wasn't trying necessarily just to imitate him, but you start picking things up. You know, and it's funny because you get around people, and you can tell who they've been listening to, especially in the church, you know, because you'll watch some people, and they'll start to preach, and it's funny. When they start preaching, the first thing they'll do is they'll, it, it, they're, they're totally themselves till they start walking. Then as soon as they start walking, and they'll start doing this, and you're like, oh, you've been watching Kenneth Hagin. Now you're just going to watch. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark 11th chapter, 23rd verse, and just to start going. And, and they'll do the same thing. And you can tell who people were trained under by how they talk. You know, if you, if, it's amazing to watch some of these people because they say the exact same words. You know, it's like you got Kenneth Copeland, 
God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Now, of course, that's Kenneth Copeland, uh, or you have the colorized version called Creflo Dollar. <laughs> right? Because they're identical. Why? Because they trained under each other. I mean, do you get that? Because you just, you get around people, certain people. And I'll never forget, one day I was preaching, and I, I remember I'm talking to people, and I'm leaning over, and I realize how I'm standing, I'm like, this is like Dr. Sumrall. So I try not to do it on purpose. In a few minutes, I'm doing the same thing again. I'm like, so you just got to go in Jesus' name. Just tell it to get out. You know? And I'm like, yeah, bless God. <laughs> you know? And he's kind of running with it, you know? <clears throat> but I, I, I grew up under all these people, you know, watching different things. And, what, and the more you watch them, the more you start getting bits and pieces of it. And you can start watching certain people and go, ah, he was with him and he sat under him. And you can tell by that. Why? Because that's discipleship. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to imitate. Just like Paul said, imitate me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Amen? <clears throat> imitate God as dear children. So that's what we're supposed to do. It's not wrong. It's right. Why? And if we had done that from the beginning, imagine how we'd look today. It'd be different. Amen? <clears throat> so there has to be that, <clears throat> that sense. But if you don't get this, see, I know people right now that can quote the Bible way better than I can. People that have, I wouldn't say they necessarily have a better understanding of different pieces, but they have some good stuff. And yet at the same time, the big problem is they don't get this piece. They don't, get, they don't understand that <clears throat> understanding authority is understanding faith. If you don't understand authority, you'll never understand faith. Faith has an authority. Faith doesn't beg. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Faith doesn't beg. Faith commands. <clears throat> That's what Dr. Summerall used to tell us. <clears throat> he said, we asked him, what is faith? He stepped back and he just did this. And he said, faith is one foot in front of the other without stopping. You just don't stop. You keep moving forward. <clears throat> faith has an authority. He, and I remember him, he would always say, uh, <clears throat> it'll be this way. And I don't mean Maybe. And I remember hearing him pray that, and I'm thinking, who, who talks like that? <clears throat> and then I realized a son of God talks like that. Amen. I started to realize a person with dominion, a person with faith in God talks like that. And <clears throat> that's the kind of people that the devil listens to. That's the kind of people <clears throat> that the devil will obey. Because the point is you've got to get him to obey you. Amen? Amen. Now listen, you tell the devil to go. And then you back off. You wait five minutes, nothing happens. You go, must not be God's will. The devil knows that. He knows most Christians, if, if he can wait 10 minutes, he can outlast you. Amen. He'll, he'll know, you tell him to go, he goes, no, just don't move. Just hang on. They'll, they'll give up in a few minutes because they'll think it isn't God's will if we don't leave. And they just hang out till you give up because they're not used to Christians pushing forward. They're not used. And it's Wigglesworth. <clears throat> Wigglesworth made a statement. He said, if you pray 100 times, you pray 99 times in unbelief, right? That's probably the only stupid thing he ever said, you know, because it's not accurate. Jesus prayed for a man twice. If, if he prayed for a man twice, I might have to pray three times. Maybe, maybe not. I don't want to pray any more than I have to, but I'm willing to pray as much as I have to. And like Brother Hagin used to say, when you're willing to stay there all day, you probably won't have to be there very long. Why? Because you go in with the idea of, I'm going to win this thing, and I'm not going to be here all day. He said, but if you go in planning it's going to take all day, he said, take a sack lunch, because you're going to be there all day. That's just the way it is. You get what you expect. People say, well, you know, that, oh, this kind of, oh, this is a hard, this is a hard thing. And that's why <clears throat> when you talk to people and they say, well, how long has it been like this? What does that matter? He said, well, Jesus asked that. <clears throat> well, yeah, Jesus asked that. Why, why did Jesus ask that? <clears throat> See, I never understood that until this. I was in North Carolina. A young girl, uh, I think she was around 12, 11 or 12, had leukemia. I uh, didn't know any of the details. Uh, this has happened twice now, like this. Or actually, more than that, but these are two instances. And <clears throat> when we got there, I had to ask the lady, how long has she been like this? And they told me how long she'd been like that. And <clears throat> now, I didn't know. Okay, when I found out how long she'd been that way, it didn't give me more power. What it did was it helped me stir up compassion. Because I thought, this is pitiful. This child's been like this since she was that old. That's, that's, that's not right. And that compassion stirred up. 
A young girl came to my house one time. She was 21 years old. She had had cancer. She had had several operations. She had cancer all over her body, different places. And they would do an operation, get what they thought they could. They thought they had it all five different times. <clears throat> and every time it would come back in a different place. And so they just kept cutting on her and kept cutting things out and off and on. It's, it's horrible. And so and some people told me about her. She was going to come over. And uh, <clears throat> I said, okay, yeah, bring her over to the house. And I had all my stuff. I had a little area on the floor <clears throat> that I was trying to spread everything, all my papers out, and I was going through stuff and sorting things. And this person brought this girl in. They're standing there, and I'm just sorting, really not paying too much attention. Just, you know, I'm just there, and I'm sorting papers out. And I said, okay, what... Um, what do you want to, I said, what, what, what's your situation? Tell me your situation. They had told me about it, but I didn't know all the details. So she started telling me about this and started telling me about this operation, started telling me about this thing and this cancer. And, and I'm like, okay, and, you know, and I could tell the guy that brought her out there, he was getting kind of upset because I wasn't engaging. I was just kind of listening, you know, still sorting papers, sitting on the floor. <clears throat> and she was standing there and the guy was standing over by her. And I'm just, <clears throat> I'm listening, but wasn't engaging. And the guy, I could tell he was getting upset because I wasn't. And so finally she said, uh, I said, so how, does, how has this affected you? And she said, well, probably the worst thing is um, <clears throat> I've got a two-year-old little boy I've never been able to pick up and hold. Exactly. When she said that, it was on. I mean, I'm just like, oh, bless God. <laughs> mm -hmm, you know, and it's like David talking, oh, no, no, the devil just should not and I hadn't have done that, you know. And so I just get up. And I start to walk around all my paperwork, and I walk over toward that girl, and I'm, art, I'm mad now. But that's compassion. Mm -hmm. See, compassion has two sides, love and hatred. Mm -hmm. You love the people, you hate what the devil's doing to them. Yes. That's compassion. Yes. If you don't hate what the devil's doing, you don't have compassion for that person yet. And if you don't have that, if you don't think you have that, I can tell you how to find out. Go over to St. Jude's and walk through the halls. Yes. And if you don't feel anything, just go ahead and hit yourself in the head with a hammer because you're already dead. But if you can walk through there and you see what the devil has done to these children, if you don't feel something, there's something wrong with you. And so I get up and I walk around this thing and I start walking toward it. And it's funny because this girl, by her own admission, she was a Baptist. And she had told this guy, I don't know anything about this healing stuff. That was what she said. So I don't know anything else other than that. But it's so funny because I start walking toward her. And as I walk around, she, she's standing there and telling the story. And then she stops when I get up. I guess I kind of surprised her because she just stopped. I start walking toward her, and she goes, you know? And I'm, and I'm like, I thought she didn't know anything, but she, she, you know, she assumed the position. She knows exactly what to do, you know? And so I'm walking toward her, and so as I get near, now the, this is one of the, when I first started, and I started to put, I was going to put my hands on the side of her head and just pray, because I was pretty, you know, uh, aggressive at that point. And so I was still praying kind of the old way that I used to, and I would take people either by the head or something like that, lay my hands on her head. And so I get near her, and as I get near her, I put my hands up because I'm going to put my hands on her head. And as I get near her, I get about a foot away, and as I move, she starts to rock backward. And I saw her. I thought she was going to fall, so I pulled my hands back, and she came back forward. And so I put my hands back up. She went back again. And so there was this like this about a foot buffer in between us that if I got my hand within a foot, she would move. And so I do this, and I'm looking at her, and she'd come back forward. And I'm like, and she'd go back, and I'd pull my hand back, and she'd come forward. And I'm like, now I'm testing it. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and, and she's literally doing this. And I'm like, and the guy's standing there, I'm looking at him like, <laughs> you know, and I'm kind of like, I want to do this, you know. <laughs> and say, see, see, I'm not kidding. That's, that's what went through my mind, right? And I'm like, I wonder if I could make her... You know, <laughs> see, I'm just being honest with you. I'm, I was testing this stuff, trial and error. I was trying stuff out. I'm going back and forth. And then finally, I, I, I said, okay, so I moved toward her, and I got about this far away. I never touched her, actually. But as I got it that far away, all of a sudden, she, her knees buckled. She went, and she goes, and she opened her eyes, and she goes, what was that? And I said, I, what happened? And she said, something just went whoosh through my body. And I said, oh, that was the Holy Ghost. He just whooshed all that cancer out. And she said, really? I said, yeah, sounds right to me. Said, yeah, makes sense, you know. <laughs> so they left. She said, thank you. And they left. And then I, about two weeks later, 
Uh, it wasn't even two weeks later, it was shorter than that. She went back to the doctor, no cancer. Completely free of cancer, right? Now, so, but this was, you know, you start these things and you start to learn how to minister these things, but people, I don't do not remember how I got on that story, but anyway, <laughs> but yeah, because I was, I, 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 but I never touched her, right? But, and you have to realize, your faith because what it was, is it was about the compassion thing. That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> that, that compassion rose up when I heard about that, that her not being able to hold her baby. We have a, a video. Again, I keep remember. I keep trying to remember to bring the thing. I got it with me. I'll, I'll bring it. Next, next one, remind me, <laughs> okay, <clears throat> to bring the uh, video. But we have a testimony from Australia where a lady was healed in the meeting, and she had MS. Yeah, MS. And, um, but, and I, I, now I ministered to her, but then I went on and right after that, she gave her testimony and she, and she started crying and said, the best blessing is now I'll be able to pick up my grandbabies. And when I heard that, see, that was the first I'd heard about that. But when I hear that, it registers with me, right? <clears throat> Cause if it's dealing with children, it, 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 I'm right there, right? I don't have to stir myself up when it comes to children. <laughs> so <clears throat> now. We want to move on. Yeah, go to the last one, page 44. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Notice here, came to pass, verse 11, the day after that he went into a city called Nain, many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. You see that? The boy is dead. He had compassion on the mother. He did not have compassion on the dead boy. He had compassion on the mother. Notice the dead can be raised by having compassion on somebody else. Do you get that? He had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And he came and touched the bear, which is a casket, we would call it. And they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, I've been in situations, I told you about one earlier, I didn't get to go into detail, but I was going from out of Arkansas into Memphis, Tennessee on Highway 40. <clears throat> this was just before Christmas, after Thanksgiving, but before Christmas. And I was heading across, and there was some snow on the ground, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm driving through, I'm talking to my wife on the phone. I was heading from Colorado, I think it was, and I had to get back to North Carolina where my wife and my family were. And so <clears throat> when I was heading back that way, I'm driving the road, talking to my wife on the phone, and I see all this commotion going on on the highway. So I told her, I said, listen, I got to go. I think there's been a wreck or something. I'm going to see if I can help. So we hung up. I pulled up behind, see all these cars parked there, and I see this one truck over on its side. So I walked up, and there was a man standing there, and I said, uh, what's going on here? And so he said, and it's funny because <laughs> no matter how I'm dressed, uh, the same thing happened when we had to go through Las Vegas one time because I was teaching a DHT out in Henderson, which is a suburb. And no matter how I'm dressed, when I, when I get out and I start walking up somewhere, I'll ask a question, and they usually answer me by saying, uh, well, no, officer, but <laughs> automatically, Right. Same thing happened in Vegas. I was in a black Tahoe. I started to pull down the street, and this guy got out and said, no, no, you can't come down. Oh, oh, okay, officer, you can go through. And he waved me on through. I'm like, okay, so we just went on through. <laughs> but we weren't supposed to, okay? But it's funny because I used to wonder about that. But my dad was a cop, right? I was raised by a cop. So guess what? I walk like a cop. I hold myself like a cop. I, I talk to people like a cop would talk to people. Right? And so, you know, I'm surprised I don't walk around and put my hand, you know, rest my hand here like most cops do their guns. <laughs> With concealed carry, you could do it anyway. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But we had, um, so we're going through there. And as I get out, I walk up to this man and I said, uh, uh, excuse me, what's going on here? And he said, uh, well, there's a, a man had a heart attack and he's dead. And I said, okay, can, can I see the body? And he looked at me kind of strange and said, yeah, it's over here. And so I walked around the truck, and there's this guy on the ground in the snow with a blue windbreaker pulled up over his head from his head to about his waist. 
So I walk over to him. Now, there's about 12, 12, 10, 12, 15 people there, and they're kind of in a semicircle about 15, 20 foot away. And so this man's laying there. I walk over to him. I take the blue windbreaker, pull it down off of his face, and I knelt down in the snow next to him. And when I knelt down, I pulled the windbreaker off. I'm looking at him, and I got so mad. I mean, I got furious. But it's, and the, the, here's the, and this is the point. When I saw him, I remember thinking, there is no way the devil is going to steal this man from his wife and his two daughters. I didn't know if this man's married. I didn't know he had two daughters. It had to be a gift of the Spirit that God gave me that would cause the compassion to stir up. Do you get that? He didn't give me a gift of healing to raise a guy. He gave me a word of knowledge to stir up the compassion. And so whenever I saw that, the first thing I said, and notice, first, the only thing I've ever said, I said, in the, I laid my hands on him. I said it probably three or four times, maybe three times. I said, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And remember, that's what I said with my daughter. Why did I say it over him? Work last time. Right? You just automatically, you don't stop and think. You function. You, you act. Right? And so I, I did that. Nothing happened. I got up, turned to walk off, got about almost halfway to the people where they were standing around the circle. And all of a sudden, I heard what it sounded like a belch. I know it's gross, but it's just what it sounded like. It sounded like a belch. And I turned to look, and this guy raised his head up, opened his eyes, and started moving his head around. Now, right then, you would think people would rush to him. Wrong. Everybody. Everybody was gone. I mean, everybody ran in every direction. And one man ran behind the guy's truck. because The truck, he had had a heart attack, apparently, and had run, run off the road, and the truck turned over, and they pulled him out. So this one guy ran around behind the turned over truck and was looking around the truck going, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, Lord Jesus, oh, Lord. And it was, so, it was so surreal. I'm standing there, I'm thinking, and I remember thinking, well, at least he knew who did it. You know? I was like, he wasn't back there yelling, oh, oh, Buddha. Why? Because Buddha doesn't have a reputation of raising the dead. Amen? So I'm, I'm looking at him, and about that time, uh, an ambulance, see, by this point, the police and the ambulance, nobody had come up yet. This had just really started happening. And so now the ambulance came up one way, a police, a, um, and the police came up the other direction. They get out and they start telling everybody, go, go. I was heading back to my car. Why? Because I had a loaf of bread. I was going to go get a piece of bread because I was going to give it to this guy. And so they stopped me and they're like, okay, if you, don't, you know, if you don't have anything to do here, go ahead and get in the cars and leave and they run everybody off. Well, there was this woman that came up behind me when I got to my van, or my, my Tahoe at that time. Yeah. And she said, um, I saw what you did. And I'm like, what? And she said, you used the name of Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she said, are, are you going to be able to go with him to the hospital? And I said, no, I've got to get to North Carolina. And she said, well, I'm going to go to the hospital, and if you give me your number, I'll get in touch with you. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. So she went to the hospital, follows up on it, right? And then she called me about a week later, and she said, here's, I thought you'd want to know the story. And I said, yeah, what's going on? She said, whenever he was at the hospital, he knew what happened. He knew that somebody used the name of Jesus to call him back. He heard that, and he came back. She said, but he's a Jehovah's Witness. And she said that when the people from the Kingdom Hall got there, they told him, if you keep saying this, we're going to kick you out of the Kingdom Hall. And so he said, I'm not going to talk to anybody about it anymore. And she said, but I got all the details on it. And she sent us all the details and all the story. And now, <clears throat> jokingly, okay, afterwards, <clears throat> we were talking about this. And so, because now we've seen about 12, 13, about 13 people come back. Different, first being my daughter, two twins still in the womb. Doctors said they were dead. They were born alive and healthy. I mean, we could, there are several different situations. A Buddhist lady in Thailand uh, was brought back from the dead. Uh, a man in the back of an ambulance. Uh, the, the, the wife laid my, her phone on his chest while I commanded life, and he was uh, brought alive in the ambulance. And so just different situations like this. Now, and I always said, well, you know, no wonder the man had to come back. He was Jehovah's Witness. They don't believe in hell. He had nowhere to go. So anyway, so just joking, right? Now, <laughs> so, but do you realize it was that compassion? See, you've got to realize this, this is not some mysterious thing. Listen, if healing is mysterious, 
what are you doing here? If it's mysterious, it makes no sense for you to come here and me to teach you this. If it just happens when it happens and we have nothing to do with it, then we're all just wasting our time. But if Jesus taught his disciples and they learn by watching how he did things, and we can learn by watching how he did things, and by experiencing these things, and our experience lines up with the Word of God, then we can learn it, and we can teach it. Amen? Amen. And if I can teach it to you, and then you can learn it and do it, then you can teach it to others. That's the purpose. Amen? Amen. All right, got to send you to break, I think. Yes, break. Okay, I'll send you to break. All right. Y'all get anything out of this? Yes. All right, well, we're... Moving along at a snail's pace, but we're getting there, so we'll get it all done.